Physical intelligence, as described by authors Claire Dale and Patricia Payton, is a measure of a person's self-awareness and self-mastery. This is almost synonymous with the related term interoception, which is the capacity to monitor and thus influence your own physiological state, which may in turn impact on mood and performance. It's a really interesting concept and the cool part is that it's something that can be trained and improved. Doing so can have direct and amazing benefits for your health, cognitive performance, relationships, athleticism and more. Recently, more and more people have been championing the importance of EQ. EQ is your emotional quotient or your emotional intelligence and is supposed to measure your ability to understand and work with the emotions of others. This has further been extended to include a knowledge and control of one's own emotions. I just uploaded an in-depth post on this over at thebioneer.com so I highly recommend you go and check that out. But while EQ is certainly important, it can actually be seen as merely a facet of something even more important, physical intelligence. Another way to think about this is as knowing how to understand and use your own body. And if this sounds like something you should already know how to do, then, well yeah. But nevertheless, it's also something a lot of us struggle with. It's something we rarely think about, and it certainly doesn't get taught in schools. An example that I like to give is getting hangry. Most of us know that we become irritable when we're hungry, but being physically intelligent would mean recognising when this has happened, understanding why it has happened, and knowing how to deal with it. So why do we get hangry? The answer has to do with the relationship between glucose, tryptophan, cortisol and serotonin. See, when you've just eaten a big carb-packed meal, you also increase levels of tryptophan. This is an essential amino acid that is also a precursor to serotonin. That means that the brain can use it to synthesise serotonin. Tryptophan also has the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier via a carrier protein. What this means is that after a big meal, the brain is high in serotonin. You've probably heard serotonin referred to as the happiness hormone. Indeed, serotonin is both a hormone and a neurotransmitter that encourages feel-good emotions and helps us to relax. Over time, serotonin is broken down to create melatonin, the sleep hormone, which is why we feel content and drowsy after a big meal. But as you start to use up the available energy and glucose drops, so too do your serotonin levels. Moreover, the body begins to release epinephrine, adrenaline, glucagon, growth hormone and cortisol. This makes sense, the body needs glucose as its primary energy source. These chemicals help to modulate the body's response to low blood sugar. Glucagon dissipates insulin for example, but it also helps to raise plasma glucose concentrations via stimulating liver glucose production, while simultaneously making the individual more driven and focused. In other words, if you feel a bit stressed, then you're more likely to go out and try to find food. But most people have a constant access to food and don't need to go into fight or flight mode to start hunting and gathering. So instead we simply become moody. That's when our partner, who is also hungry, shouts at us for leaving the washing up and we bark back with a disproportionate response. Before you know it, you're bringing up personal insults and things that happened years ago. And then you both feel awful. The physically intelligent individual would understand that their thoughts might be a little extra negative owing to their hunger and might therefore decide to postpone their heated response. They might understand how to restore calm balance to their autonomic nervous system in the short term by using breathing techniques or they might use cognitive behavioural therapy to calm their racing thoughts. They might even galvanise that nervous energy and put it to good use by tidying the house while their food cooks. Thus a little more physical intelligence in this one regard can potentially help a person to avoid arguments, improve their relationships and even improve their performance. Emotional intelligence meanwhile comes from understanding that your other half might also be hungry or tired or anxious. EQ means recognising this and therefore giving them the benefit of the doubt. Well, um, I, I, I said I'm sorry. You are going to face justice and may it be kinder to you than it was to us. Autobots! Transform and roll for all. In the workplace, this kind of emotional intelligence and self-management is critical, from delivering the best speech by understanding how to get your physiology under control, to managing people better by understanding how to coax the best performance out of them. Cortisol levels and negative emotions are not straightforward and directly correlated though. Hopefully, this example has helped to demonstrate just how complex this interplay of biological processes and chemicals really is. This is one reason that using drugs can be destructive. It's why nootropics that are supposed to make you smarter, unfortunately are not the answer. You can take a 5-HTP supplement, 5-hydroxytryptophan, in order to become more socially relaxed. But this is also going to risk making you a little slower, seeing as serotonin and melatonin are both inhibitory substances. The same goes for modafinil, often called the real limitless drug. 
Modafinil works on orexin and dopamine, which in turn regulates sleep-wake cycles alongside bowel movements, energy levels, appetite, and more. It's no wonder that the powerful drug that prevents sleep will also suppress appetite and force you to keep running to the toilet. While taking Adderall to boost your focus is not a physically intelligent solution to your problems then, there are other safer ways to hack your physiology to ensure you perform optimally when you need to, but here are just some examples of controlling your physiology. Splashing your face with cold water to activate the mammalian diving reflex. Taking a cold shower to increase alertness. Using power poses, although not all studies have been able to verify how effective this strategy is. Avoiding light from screens just before bed to avoid spiking cortisol. Drinking coffee to boost alertness, knowing when to stop drinking coffee. Changing your physiological state and mood by listening to or dancing to music. This is ideal for getting more energy when you need to be more productive, but you're beginning to flag. Remembering to actively relax muscles during tense moments. Manipulating meal timings to mitigate the effects of jet lag. Or my favourite, exercising throughout the day. This has been one of the most profound changes I've made to my own life, and it's transformed my own energy levels. Performing pull-ups and push-ups continuously ensures that I don't suffer from sensory motor amnesia, while keeping my metabolism up and increasing strength. In each case, you're listening to your own body and combining this with a knowledge of how it works in order to eke out greater performance and even happiness. Just be wary of some biohacks. I want to make a post on biohacking in future, but suffice to say that not all advice you hear from biohacking gurus is equally as effective. Some of these strategies are expensive and time-consuming for very little reward. Others are based on poor understanding of the science and can even be harmful. It's also useful to recognise that everyone is different. Some people don't get hangry so much as nervous and shaky. That's me. Physical intelligence also means knowing how you personally respond and thus acting ahead. For example, if you know that you start getting hangry about three hours after a big meal, then perhaps that could tell you how to plan out your meals a bit better on a big day. We can likewise think about chronotype in this context. Different people function better at different times of day. In one study, 100 meter race performance varied as much as 26% based on the individual's chronotype and the time of day the run took place. Of course, interoception is the result of many different systems working together. An obvious culprit is the vagus nerve, which handles communication between autonomic functions and the brain. This is how breathing rapidly is able to alter stress levels, for example. Then there are less direct connections, such as the aforementioned role of tryptophan after eating. And we know how gut bacteria can likewise contribute to the production of neurotransmitters that alter mood and even metabolism. The anterior cingulate cortex appears to be one of the brain regions most responsible for mediating interoceptive attention. This area works alongside the insula of the cerebrum, which is responsible for the sense of self and emotional state. But one of the most surprising sources of interoception is the fascia. You didn't think I was going to go a whole video without mentioning fascia, did you? Fascia, as I've discussed on the Bioneer several times before, is a kind of sheath of connective tissue that is found throughout the human body. We now know that it contains its own smooth muscle cells that may help contribute towards healthy movement. But even more fascinating is that it is actually riddled with nerve endings. Many of these nerve endings are proprioceptors, suggesting that the muscle fascia may contribute to our mental model of our own body. But we now also know that the fascia likely contains seven times more interoceptors. These are free nerve endings that have countless crucial roles, among which is to provide feedback regarding states such as hunger and warmth to regulate emotional responses. In fact, the human visceral fascia, which helps to suspend organs within their cavities, contains countless nerves that link directly to the insula, showing how things like hunger and fatigue can directly impact on mood. These sensations are also used in our development of gut feelings and intuition, handled by large and densely connected brain cells called spindle cells. These cells are considered crucial for social abilities, but are also key in steering behaviour based on visceral reactions. And similar abilities of the superficial fascia show us why massaging, hugging, stroking and tickling can all result in emotional responses. Keep in mind that all these signals are then interpreted in a highly context-sensitive manner. That is to say that a light stroke on the leg can be interpreted as arousing, ticklish or deeply upsetting depending on the context. The same goes for your sense of fatigue or arousal. And this is one reason why you can quickly make someone extremely angry by asking them, why are you so angry today? This is an example of biohacking another person. Interoception is just one of the senses that we often overlook. Another is proprioception, or body sense. This is our kinesthetic awareness, our knowledge of where our body is in space at any given time. Interoception and proprioception are extremely closely linked, and in many cases, the line is blurred. For example, many people carry a lot of stress with them, but don't even realize it. 
As we know, a fight or flight response increases muscle tension, and so we sit there, with jaws clenched and shoulders raised. This can lead to pain and discomfort, but it also further elevates stress, seeing as the communication between these signals is a two-way street. Being stressed makes us clench up, and being clenched up makes us more stressed. So I ask you, where are your shoulders right now? Are you clenching your jaw? Even if you don't think you are, try actively relaxing, and you might be surprised how much more relaxed you could have been. This of course can be highly beneficial for athletes. Wasting energy by walking around like a giant clenched fist is not conducive to optimal performance. Even personality has an impact here. A huge impact in fact. Of course a more stressed person will carry more tension with them, and this has benefits as well as downsides. You can then learn different amounts of tonus to carry with you, so that your muscles are more or less relaxed by default. Want to know something crazy but logical when you think about it? Extroverts actually have faster reaction times according to multiple studies. Tom Myers, in a conversation with Dr. Robert Schlepp, gave a fascinating example of keeping your arm raised for a long period of time. Proprioception is what tells you where your arm is, but the overwhelming urge to lower the arm as it gets tired is an example of interoception. This shows how these two systems work together. This is emotional and based on inputs such as heat and hydrogen buildup. This is something that all bodybuilders should be rather familiar with. Myers went on to describe this as a kind of battle between your own interoceptive feedback. Who wins? The fascia telling you that you need to eat, or your own will? A key takeaway here is that all of these systems are linked and intertwined. Everything from our personality, to our physical strength, to our reaction times, to our gut bacteria, to our proprioception, to how hungry we are, to the environment around us. There is constant communication between all of these shifting and changing systems. A truly transformative training program should recognise the system as a whole. So with all that said, how can you improve your interoception and your ability to recognise what your body is telling you, so that you can work with it rather than against it? Exercising and especially improving proprioception can help a lot. As we've seen, this is very closely linked with interoception and will help you to better be aware of what your body is doing at any given time. Using biofeedback is another great strategy. That means using heart rate monitors and fitness trackers to tell you how things like heart rate are changing. By being aware of this, you can then learn to recognise the cues from your own body without needing an external device. One study showed that when subjects were required to check their own heart rate regularly throughout the day, they'd eventually learn the ability to control their own heart rate at will. Meditation, of course, can also help us to choose how to focus our attention and to work through certain sensations where appropriate. Cognitive behavioural therapy can help us to change the context of sensations in order to manage our emotional response to them. But the rest is learning. The more you understand about the way your body works and the different physiological systems involved, the more you can intellectualise the sensations you're interpreting. Hopefully, you will leave this video a little more physically intelligent than you were before, and a little more aware of your interoception than you began. So I hope you found this video useful and interesting guys, if you did then please leave a like and share it around, that helps me out immensely. Thank you so much for watching this one. Subscribe if you want much more like this, and leave a comment below letting me know how you use interoception and physical intelligence in your own life. As you guys know, I currently have a book for pre-order on Amazon and many other retailers, that's called Functional Training and Beyond, and that book explores the origins and the impact of functional training techniques. It looks at many different forms of training and shows how to combine them in a way that makes them more applicable to everyday life. And taking performance beyond just the ordinary. Alternatively, I also have an ebook and training program called Super Functional Training. You can find a link to that in the description below. There's a discount on right now, so we're all in lockdown. And that's basically a full training program and massive guide that discusses all the things I talk about on this training and combines it into a single program to improve physical and mental performance. Either way, I hope you guys are all staying safe and well. Thank you so much for watching this, and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.